You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you extraordinarily well. Welcome to the last story for the month of May, 2023, issue 200. We hope you've enjoyed all of these stories that we've brought to you this month and every prior month. We want to thank you again for your support, whether it's your first story here at Clark's World or over 800 at this point. We cannot thank you enough for stopping by, listening, appreciating the cover art, the nonfiction. Thank you for subscribing or telling a friend. If you haven't yet, please consider doing all of those and for visiting patreon.com forward slash Clark's World. Just a dollar a month or more can really help us out. Our last story for the month is titled The Fall and is by Jordan Chase Young. Now, Oregon's gray skies stamped Jordan Chase Young into a science fiction writer. Now he lives in Australia with his wife, Katie, and their psycho cat, Hilda. When he's not working or puzzling over the fate of his starving species through Poe's, he's drawing strange creatures or strolling through Melbourne's sunny streets for inspiration. His stories have appeared or are forthcoming in Escape Pod, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, the Zombies Need Brains anthology when worlds collide, and many other venues. He occasionally blogs about the future at ebook of the new sun. So my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Blue earth shine and bare sunlight soaked the forest of the moon. The trees stood in silence, white as bone. They, like the animals that dwelt here, had been shaped long ago to survive without atmosphere. The forest was strange and beautiful, but Shul feared losing her way in it. Her suit held air for five more hours, enough for her task with some left over. She didn't walk so much as bound, regolith blooming underfoot like short-lived flowers. Some of her crew liked Loji, found it liberating. To her, it felt unnatural, like dreams with dulled physics. She feared having to escape any predators. The probes had scanned huge swaths of the forest, and scholars had wrung knowledge of it from pre-fall relics. Much remained unknown. The moon had been abandoned for millennia. Who knew what beasts had evolved from the biomodded fauna that pre-falls had left behind? Happily, the animals she'd seen so far were harmless. She photographed them for the settlement's research project. Big white worms and lanky rabbit frog things. They slithered and hopped away from her, but she was quick with the camera, curling her toes with joy whenever she got a good photo. She clicked through the pics she'd taken, relishing the thought of being the first soul since the fall to snap the moon's fauna. If she did nothing else on this mission, she'd get her notch in history for that. Probe pics were trash. The crude robots had beamed nothing of aesthetic value to Earth. But these pics? Folk would cite her. Plunk her work in glossy mags. Sure, her crewmates, biologists and archaeologists and chemists, would enjoy legacies too. But would anyone other than academics learn their names? Let those eggheads look down on her as a soft-headed artist? She'd get the last laugh. She was scrolling through pics with pride when her eyes snagged on something in one. An odd little thing in the regolith. Zooming in, she gasped. She doubled back and scoured the area, checking and rechecking her camera till she found the object. She picked it up, full of wonder. A doll. Unimaginably ancient, with willowy limbs and long hair that shifted in low G as if underwater. A prefall, not small and stubby limbed like modern humans. The outfit was odd, a two piece affair instead of a jumpsuit. Jewel smiled sadly, feeling a bond with the owner across time. Whoever they were, they'd been a flesh and bone human like her, not just a piece of history. It was easy to forget that. Wistfully, Shul shook dust off the doll and straightened its hair. Been waiting all this time to be found, huh? Her voice echoed weirdly in her helmet. Don't worry, little one. You're in good hands now. She slipped the doll into her suit's free pouch. She checked her air level and winced. She'd lost track of time. She'd set off back toward the settlement, following the steady green blinks of her navigation beacon. She tried not to think about the forest's enormity. It filled her with unease. An hour later, the blinks grew sporadic. She smacked her beacon like an unruly appliance. 
some sort of electromagnetic anomaly. She tried her calm. Nothing. Panic mushroomed above her diaphragm. Her mission leader, Essa, had warned her not to lose focus during an essay. Worryingly susceptible to daydreaming, her first mission fitness report had said. Her only red mark. One she'd brought under control well enough to ace her final exam. If she died out here, it was her fault. All that pointless fantasizing about her legacy. Stupid. Stupid. She breathed. A moment's meditation shrank the panic enough for her to focus. Three hours of air. The panic grew past meditation's reach, filling her throat. If she could get high enough, she could spot the settlement. But the trees looked hostile to climbing, their silver leaves agleam like knives. The white wrinkled trunks resembled the poison fungi of her hometown. Could the soft bark even hold her? She was desperate. Wrapping her arms around a tree, she climbed like some awkward insect, her vacuprene gloves flensing off rubbery bark in slow cascades. About thirty meters up, she reached the crown. The boughs underfoot bent easier than any earth's tree. Even in low G, she doubted they'd keep her weight, but they did. She shimmied to the thickest bough in the sight, then climbed to another, fending the urge to look down. A human could fall farther on the moon than on Earth, but only to a point. The moon had no air resistance. A fall from this high could be fatal. She crept to the crown's edge and scanned the canopy, nothing but silver leaves, like a sea of broken solar sheets. But for the rare stirring of animals, the canopy was so still it could have been a photo. She tried her beacon and calm again. Briefly, she thought she caught someone's voice, but it was gone. She checked her air, regretted it, shimmied for another view. She was pushing aside leaves when she sensed movement, a twinge in her periphery. When she saw the thing, it was too late. The white worm whipped round her throat, knocking her off balance. She tumbled through the two weak branches and plunged from the tree. As she fell, the worm constricted. She fought it while reaching for her laser. Just as she had the weapon out, she hit the ground. Cracks webbed through her helmet. Chapel of dust rose. The weapon spinning free and vanishing through it. The worm's body forked, making lunge-like branches that wrestled her down, their sharp whiskers probing her helmet and smearing slime across fractured glass and slicing slowly through the seal. My legacy, whispered a piece of her. Dead on the moon before thirty. No children, no fame. No more picnics behind waterfalls with thrusts. Just a stupid, pointless death. The rest of her was fighting the worm, groping for the laser. Air was hissing through the helmet cracks. A beam flared and the worm flashed yellow and was gone, leaving wisps of ash in a single slack strand. An unfamiliar voice filled her calm. You okay? An astronaut in a strange suit approached, holstering a laser of her own. She helped a stunned Chul to her feet. Chul pulled the dead piece of worm off her throat and dropped it. The astronaut was half a meter taller, with long limbs and a shaven head. Her suit like something from an ancient tale, puffy and cumbersome, not sleek and form-fitting like Chul's. You're a pre-fall, Chul wanted to say, sh shock tied off her words. Nebus, my air is almost gone, Chul croaked nervously, and I'm lost. Nebeth's brown eyes twinkled. Not anymore. My home's not far. A warm tide of relief crashed over Chul. Thank God, oh thank God. Nebeth led her through the forest in no great hurry. Chul's astonishment overwhelmed her fear. A community of prefalls still living on the moon? There was precedent. A few... Denisovians had lingered in New Guinea long after humankind's other cousin species had died. She'd seen a vert on it, but this, this was far more incredible. We've been watching your settlement, Nebeth's voice came oddly clear through Chul's calm. I don't understand. Our probes work around the clock, laser scanning the forest and underground bases. They picked up no activity. A place this big, you think your bots will see everything. No, but abandoned vanity. Don't make our mistake thinking you know all there is to know. Nebeth's lack of urgency was frustrating. Chul's air was falling fast, but she kept her calm. She didn't know pre-fall customs, and the last thing she wanted was to make Nebeth upset. How long have you been watching us? As soon as you arrived, said Nebeth. 
You've made no contact. Why? The others don't want to scare you off. You're joking. I don't joke. Scare us? You're, you're a treasure. You're the first pre-fall anyone's encountered. We thought you were dead. All of you. This changes everything for humanity, for me. I'll go down in history as the one who found you. Nebeth laughed a high, cold laugh. <laughs> well, I'm happy for you. What's Earth like these days, anyway? Healing, slowly. The seas are still underpopulated. The rainforests are near pre-industrial levels. How did you manage that? Most industries underground now, and robots scrub the atmosphere. How much farther? Chul thought of blocking the cracks in her helmet with her hand, but she worried the glass would collapse at a touch. Almost there, said Nebeth. It sounds like humans are on a roll, but then so are we. We won't screw up again, said Shul firmly. Nebeth's tone grew amused. How can you be sure? I have faith. Forgive me for not sharing it. Shul couldn't blame her. She couldn't imagine Nebeth's life, isolated from civilization, convinced it was gone, only natural, she would have fallen into a fatalism so deep even learning humans had recovered couldn't fix it. When Nebeth got back to Earth, maybe she would see things different. Maybe. We called this forest Greyhaven, said Nebeth. It was a dry run for terraforming the solar system, and eventually the galaxy, but that wasn't our destiny any more than it is yours. Our destiny was death. Destiny is not something you have, it's something you choose. That idealism again. You think humankind and all its squalor and stupidity will find a way out of the solar system? There's a reason we've never been visited. Every civilization's on the clock. Just how it is. Nebeth's word grated so much that for a moment, Shul didn't even care about her air levels. That's crazy. If we made it this far, there's no limit to what we can do. Neither of us would be here if our ancestors saw things like you. No, they'd know better than to waste their lives on dead ends. If they had common sense, they would have spent more time protecting their gifts, family and nature and community, and less on feats of hubris. The airlock loomed between trees like an ancient tomb, all harsh edges and crude paneling. Attached was the elevator turret leading to a sublunar colony. Finally, Nebeth was cycling the airlock when Jules' calm crackled. Hello? Jules called. Can you hear me? No reply. Strange interference around here, said Nebeth. We'll find your crew. First need to get you out of that busted suit. Nebeth took Jules by the arm. The calm spat again. A man's voice garbled. The chief medic. Jules! Ivan? Chul, are you? I'm, I'm here. H here. Silence. Hello? Nebeth's face gained a shade of displeasure. I said, we'll find your crew after. They're close. I have to reach them. Nebeth's grip tightened, her big glove squeezing Chul's vacuprene. Chul tried to pull away, but Nebeth wouldn't let go. The prefall tried to drag Chul into the airlock. Stop! Wait, please. Pointless to fight your destiny. As Nebeth's head passed the airlock's threshold, her eyes dwindled like smoke from their sockets and her hair tumbled from a peeling scalp like dead moss. Her suit faded and frayed and deflated about her bones like some ancient parachute coming to rest on a knobbled armature. Her voice shriveled to a rasp. You're almost there. Chul screamed. She pulled from Nebeth with all her strength and broke free and fell backward into blooming regolith. Chul's calm exploded with Nebeth's rage and hearth, a sound of envy and despair so sharp it pinned Chul to the ground like a knife. Chul screwed her eyes shut and ground her teeth, and when the sound slowly ceased, she opened her eyes again, blinking through the sun glare. But it wasn't the sun, and she wasn't where she was supposed to be. The airlock was gone. She was back beside the tree she'd fallen from. A man was kneeling beside her, flitting a medical light across her eyes. Ivan. Essa, the mission leader, was slicing something white off of Jules' throat with a heat knife. A 
a stubborn remnant of the worm. She's concussed, said Ivan. Can you hear me, Chul? Chul could only nod. Thank God, said Essa. She's hurt bad. Ivan was pumping air into Jules' suit through a nozzle. Organ bruising, probably. Essa shook her head. Lucky she shot the worm or we'd be hauling a corpse home. Damn thing almost cut through the casing. Shot the worm, but... Chul saw that she was clutching her laser. She felt memory slipping from her like a dream after waking. But it hadn't been a dream. She knew. Knew in her bones that she'd met something. Something sad and lonely and angry and very real. All she remembered were words, words like destiny and death. They tumbled through her skull as she looked at earth above Essa's shoulder, shining weak through the white branches and silver leaves. What's this? Essa pulled the doll from Chul's pouch. The little prefall, its head lolling from a broken neck. Essa wondered at it. If Chul had any strength, she would have thrown the doll back into the shadows of the forest. But she could only stare at it, chilled by a nameless fear. What are your thoughts on the story? Thank you for joining us here at Clark's World for the month of May. We have more stories coming to you for the month of June. I hope you can come back and listen, should you so choose. And until then, my fondest, dearest listener, I do bid you a very fond and hopefully very temporary farewell. <laughs>